But I think that uh, I think there, there's sort of a, a degree to which uh, we should ask some very tough questions about why there's been such an incredible disconnect and why things haven't uh, haven't uh, quite uh, quite caught up. And um, and this sort of a perspective that uh, the technology innovation, which is the key driver of progress, has not been happening as quickly as people like to think, I think suggests a very, very different way of looking at a number of, uh, of issues that we have. And just to, um, to, cite, uh, to cite a few, I think, uh, I think we have this, there's a whole question about what in the world happened in 2008. You know, you had this economy, it was sort of, we knew there was something a little bit wrong with it, but it just blew up. And, and you know, it's, the normal culprits are that there was too much government regulation or too little government regulation. People were too greedy. They were focused on housing. They were stupid. It was some sort of behavioral mass psychology. There are all sorts of explanations like that. The one that I would suggest is that a credit crisis is fundamentally um, a technology crisis in the sense that every form of credit involves a claim on the future. And the claims on the future all of a sudden couldn't be realized because people were lending other people money and saying, well, you're going to make a lot more money in the future so I can lend you the money. And um, that assumption implicitly assumed this incredible rate of progress. And it turned out that assumption was wrong. I think if you, have, if you had tremendous growth in, uh, happening in our society, there would have been no credit crisis or it would have been sort of a temporary blip or there might have been local crises. You would not have had the kind of systematic thing that we saw in, uh, in 2008. And, and, and along these lines, I think if you take a step back and think about the history of the last quarter century, we've had sort of a whole series of these crazy bubbles. Um, probably the central and most important one really was the uh, tech boom or hyper boom or bubble of the late 90s, where um, this is, it was in some sense what had to happen to meet people's expectations in terms of all the kinds of things they were investing in and doing. And when that failed, um, you weren't going to have, you know, massive growth rates, and uh, people weren't willing to deal with that reality. And so they dealt with it by adding more and more leverage. And then it sort of came to a head in, um, in 2007 and 2008 when it turned out that you couldn't um, get huge returns in a society that, where there was basically no growth. The, um, the, the way I illustrated this, this point to some people um, who are investors in my uh, run a hedge fund and a venture fund a, a few weeks ago um, was, uh, it was an investment committee at, uh, at a university endowment. They sort of have money allocated to different things. And, and one of the people asked me, you know, we have 5% of our money is allocated to venture capital. Is this, you know, we've been thinking this is too much because it hasn't been making any money for like 11 years. And we've been wondering whether we should dial this down or not. And, you know, I, I actually, you know, I think there are some pluses and minuses. There's a lot that's not great about the venture capital industry. And so I'm somewhat agnostic on, uh, on whether it should be increased or decreased in general. But I think the, the, the really big mistake people are making is to think that um, is to think that 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 five percent actually has anything to do that has nothing to do with the other ninety five percent. And the reality is that if you're not going to make money on the five percent where you're focused on technology and innovation, the other ninety five percent are not going to work at all. And so when people have return expectations of eight, eight and a half percent, nine percent, seven and a half, whatever, per year. Um, there's no way you, you will realize those return expectations if you're earning 3.5% uh, on government 10-year bonds and there's basically uh, no growth in the economy. And if you ask, where do these numbers come from? You know, how, where did people pull these numbers out to say that they're going to get 8% a year? Um, the answer is, well, they, they've done academic studies and these studies show that the stock market goes up on average this much and they go back over the last 100 years or so. But I think almost all these studies are are flawed because they, they all basically um, happen in this period of phenomenal growth. So I think, yes, you could have realistically gotten something like 8% a year over the last 200 years by investing in relatively risky equity-like assets, but that's because we had one massive technological innovation after another. I don't think you should have expected to get 8% a year, say, in the period from 1200 to 1300 AD. Uh, I don't think you would have expected it, it during most of history or in most places. And, uh, and there's something extremely exceptional about the time that we've lived through. And uh, I think one of the really deep questions is whether, whether this, uh, this, this time is over or not. And um, 
And I think uh, in some ways uh, I would be sort of a lot more optimistic if people were more focused on this and thinking about this as a, as a counterpoint to naively assuming that technology is going to work. We, of course, don't know anything about it. We're assuming other people will do it for us. And, uh, and you run into a serious problem when everybody assumes that everybody else is going to do it and nobody is doing it. And, and nothing, nothing, of the sort, uh, nothing of the sort is happening. Um, and so I, um, um, anyway, I can, I can sort of go on on this theme in various ways, but I think um, what, uh, what, what I think, you know, we need to be thinking about as a society and as investors is what if we're actually stuck in this zone where it's very hard to get growth to come back? What should we be doing? Um, my, my own view is that we have, you know, that uh, it's almost too catastrophic to consider um, because every single, you know, it's, it's possible for our society to function if there was no growth, but it basically means people would have to work till they're 80 years old and would have to save about 40% of their money because you'd expect to earn 0% on it. And that would be, you know, that would be a realistic goal in a society where there was no technological progress. Um, and I don't think we're willing to make that adjustment. And, and so I, think, I tend to think the kind of direction uh, things need to go into is, uh, is somehow getting back to the sort of uh, uh, vision that people had in the 1950s and 1960s, and we somehow need to go, need to go back to the future. And that, uh, and that somehow, um, you know, you can sort of, there are obviously left-wing and right-wing versions of what's gone wrong. I think the, you know, the, um, the, the, the left-wing version of what's gone wrong was that it was basically, it was basically uh, crazy leverage and greedy people and sort of started with Reagan in the early 80s. The, the right-wing version of what went wrong was it went, all went haywire in the late 60s and everybody did drugs and they sort of fried their brains for the next 40 years. And, um, um, but I think um, we somehow have, which, whichever of these is true and maybe they're both correct, um, you know, I, th I think the challenge is to somehow get back to the world we were in in the late 1960s um, and to sort of get out of this detour um, of, of that, that we've been that we that we've been going through for a very long time. Anyway, I want to just throw a few thoughts out there along these lines and open it up to some questions and get some discussion going, um, and uh, go from there. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm Aaron Brown from AQR Capital Management. I, I buy your story about uh, the importance of uh, science and technology for economic growth, especially the technology half of it. But you've made a leap there from there to venture capital. It seems to me for most of the last 60 years, a lot of the science and technology has been un done in universities and research uh, entities that weren't deeply profit making. And another big chunk was captured by existing large corporations. And in some ways, the venture capital boom looks like a bit of an aberration where, and maybe it wasn't all that good that there was a lot of opportunism in there, a lot of people going chasing fast money. It did give us a lot of innovation, but it also was a very unstable thing. Is it possible we're going to get the science and technology, but not through venture capital? Um, sure, that is, that, that is, uh, that is certainly, um, that is certainly possible. I, um, I do think that if you looked at the, you know, the equivalent of venture capital, um, it would have done quite well. You know, people who invested with in Edison in the 1870s did well, or people who, you know, worked with various inventors and helped start companies, you know, got phenomenal returns. There was probably a scarcity of venture capital, you know, before about, you know, the 1970s or, or even the 1980s. Um, but I, I think it is, it is probably one measure of of, uh, of, of it. It's not by any means the only measure. Uh, there are obviously some very deep questions about what's going on in, um, in, um, in, in universities. Uh, what is the efficiency of the spending that's going on there? Uh, there, there are probably a lot of questions one could raise. Uh, sort of one, one factoid that I think is, uh, is always uh, at least slightly disturbing is that, you know, the two top academic publications are Science and Nature magazines. About half the articles written in them are basically fraudulent in the sense that when people try to verify the research, they can, they, it turns out that um, it's not accurate. And it was just in their sort of quest for tenure recognition, uh, the authors uh, engaged in s somewhere between you know, exaggeration, pr prevarication, and, and fraud. Um, and, um, and I think you know, if we actually look at what's the efficiency 
of, uh, of research going on in the universities more generally. I think there's lots of reason for skepticism. We're probably spending about 30 to 50, we have about 30 to 50 times as many scientists in the U.S. as we did in the 1920s. And it's not clear that the rate of progress is actually any greater. Uh, and then with respect to larger companies, um, I'm not sure there's that much innovation going on there either. And the, um, you know, the classic large companies we'd think of as innovative ones would be the larger tech companies. And again, maybe that's, but and let me, so let me just uh, limit my focus to those. And this would be companies like Microsoft, IBM, Oracle, Dell, Cisco, et cetera, et cetera. And there's several things that are very striking about them. The, um, uh, from a financial flows perspective, the most striking thing is they all, um, they all are massively cash flow positive and they have no idea what to do with their money, um, which is not what you would expect if they had all these great ideas of new technologies to be developing. And, and then if you think of it uh, a little bit more conceptually, uh, most of these companies basically involve bets against innovation. And, and they're actually functioning more like banks where they throw off predictable, stable cash flows as long as nothing in the world changes and there's nothing majorly disruptive. So you should invest in Microsoft if Linux is never going to work. And you should invest in IBM if we're never going to get rid of the Kluge software from the 1970s. And you should invest in Cisco and Dell and HP if there will never be any competition from China. Um, and, you know, I think Google at this point is basically a bet against new search technologies. Um, and, uh, and so I, th I, th I think the branding these companies have is that they're, they're pushing massive innovation. But, uh, but the reality is that, uh, uh, that uh, that's not what they're actually spending money on. And, in, and one of the very odd reversals from, say, the 1980s is that um, the price-earnings ratio on uh, tech stocks is now higher than on the S&P, whereas in the 80s it was lower because it was assumed, you know, it was a tech company is a risky company. It'll get displaced by another company pretty quickly, whereas today they're seen as these, you know, very stable companies where nothing's going to change at all.